Attorney General from the Attorney General's Office, and he is doing a uh, presentation on Public Records Act for us. He was going to be at the last City Council meeting. We thought this would be a really good overview on what a public record is, how offices are determining how to process them, the legal guidelines, and he's going to go through all that. So I'll just move it right over to him. Great. Well, thank you all for inviting me down to have this conversation about the Public Records Act. And, and thank you for actually coming over and uh, to, to listen to this conversation. I've done various presentations with a big room and like two people. And of course, they sit in the very back of the room kind of thing. So thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, so who I am and why, uh, why you get to listen to me for the next hour or so talk about public records is because one of my roles with the Attorney General's office is to serve as our lead attorney for our public records consultation program. And what that means is that I get to work with local governments all over the state on public records, helping them hopefully get it right. Um, and then as of about a month ago, uh, Bob Ferguson, uh, asked me to, and of course I said yes because my boss asked me to do it, uh, asked me to serve as the ombuds as well, meaning that I also am the, uh, the Assistant Attorney General for Open Government, meaning I also uh, answer a lot of questions from just members of the public that uh, call the office or that send emails into the office asking questions about Public Records Act, about the OPMA, the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, so basically all the things that we think about in terms of government transparency. Um, but this program specifically, and the reason I was coming down last week is because I was going to give a training to the city council, could, didn't make it to that, um, but that's what, my, what I do and my colleague Lucy, Coll Lucy Collis does. Um, and she, she and I both work with local governments on the Public Records Act. So that's what we're going to be talking about here this afternoon. Uh, in terms of where we're going to go this afternoon, we're going to talk a little bit about the significance about uh, the transparency of an open government, why it matters, and you know, some of it's not super surprising. Um, and then we're going to spend the majority of this afternoon talking specifically about what the Public Records Act expects of uh, agencies throughout the state. Um, you know, I really, you know, this is, this, this title of the city chat. So as we're going through, if you have questions about something, please feel free to interrupt me. I will do my best to provide you with information I can um, and things like that, but uh, yeah, please do. The one thing that I, I don't do and I can't do in this context and I don't do it when I'm working with local governments is I don't provide legal advice. Uh, I don't take the place of the city's attorneys or the county's attorneys or things like that. Um, and a lot of times when I talk with members of the public, I can share hopefully good information uh, but sometimes the best thing I can do is say, here's some, here's some framework, and you really need to talk with an attorney about the specifics of this situation and whatnot. So keep that in mind. Uh, my goal here today is really to provide you with kind of a good foundation of what the Public Records Act is, where we, you know, how we got here, you know, and the, the significance it plays. So the reason that, you know, there's lots of reasons to, to do this. Um, and one of them is that when you start talking about the Public Records Act, occasionally agencies do have disagreements with requesters over um, whether, whether they search for all the records, whether they provided all the records, um, whether, they, uh, you know, whether an exemption, and we'll talk a little bit about exemptions and what that is, uh, whether those are properly applied to the record. So when you get down the road, one of the things the courts look at if there's been an issue, somebody's been denied access to records, is the whole idea about penalties in the PRA is that it is to encourage agencies to get it right the next time. Um, it's to encourage that future performance. And so one of the things that the courts look at, and the reason why I was supposed to be here last week talking with city council, um, and why actually tomorrow I'm over in Ellensburg, uh, on Monday I'll be up in Newport, um, over outside of Spokane, so I get a lot of miles on my car too, um, is because the courts care about, uh, does the agency take it seriously? Is the agency meeting its obligations? And one way to show that is trainings like this that I give for local governments. Um, and I do a lot with public records officers, the people in charge of actually processing public records requests. Uh, I talk with a lot of city council, county councils, you know, public utility districts, helping their leadership understand what the PRA really requires. Uh, because a lot of times when we talk about agency leaders, you know, they want to get involved, they, be, they, run, they, they get elected, and then they're like, great, now what do I do? Um, and one of the things that people don't think about when they're running for office or, you know, even they're new to public sector is the transparency expectations. So that's what these trainings really try to help people accomplish. So how we got here in terms of the Public Records Act, 
you know, this is one of those things that the people of the state of Washington care about. This is something that was actually done by an initiative back in 1972. And it kind of makes some sense if you look at how, you know, think about what was going on just politically in the United States. We're coming out of the 60s. Uh, mm -hmm. People are really challenging what's going on. Why is government making the decisions it's making? And so the, in 1972, by initiative, we passed and we enacted our, the state's first public records law. What's interesting about it is if, if you go back and you read, read the voters pamphlet from 1972, and just to tell you how much of a PRA nerd that I kind of am, I've done that. Um, and I was, I think it was, I was four at the time. Um, so I didn't do it back then, I've done it recently. Uh, and really what was going on, what, the, what that initiative was talking about was, was campaign finance. And obviously that's still important. In the 50 years since that time period, PRA has really grown into something of itself. It's really become an effective tool for you know the way we keep track of what's going on with governments. Um, if you go, we have to go back and look at the history of it. You'll see that in 2005, it doesn't look like it existed before that. That's because in 2005, the legislature did a lot of work on the Public Records Act. It got recodified, um, basically moved elsewhere in the code. Uh, but if you want to look at where it is now, it's at 4256. Um, and there's lots of stuff in there. Some of it's really dry. Um, but if you, if you read the first, you know, the first, like, if you're actually going to read the code, the first, you know, 10 sections or so is kind of where the, the meat of it is. And then skip about the 500s, because our legislature, they kind of, you know, divvied it up for us for some reason. I'm not totally sure why. And that's kind of what you, you should look at. Digging a little bit deeper than that, um, and you look at if you look at the purposes that are in that initiative, if you look at the, the voters pamphlet when they, um, and if you look at the uh, actually what's interesting about the voters pamphlet is the voters pamphlet really didn't talk much about PRA at all. It was really talking about campaign finance. Uh, it's been since then. So if you go back and read the, the initiative from back then, um, or if you read any recent court decision, what you see is language like this. You know, the people of the state of Washington, we don't yield, all, yield, yield our sovereignty to the people that we put in charge of our governments. Um, and that's really the foundation. Every time this is in front of the courts, the courts are kind of looking to this principle when they're talking about what's the expectation for the PRA. Did an agency do what they're supposed to do? They always start with this general language to kind of set the framework. Um, and it, it's instructive, I think, because it really does carry through when the courts are saying, you know, did you meet your obligations and how are we going to interpret the RCWs that are the Public Records Act? It'll always look at it through this lens and the idea of let's make things transparent. Um, and it's because of this kind of principles about, you know, we don't delegate our authority, we, we insist on remaining informed, things like that. So the reasons we should care about this. Um, and you know, if you look at the, I just, I'm going to kind of go through this and picking one of them. Um, you know, I really like this quote from Justice Brandis um, in terms of sunlight being the, the best disinfectant. What's, you know, Justice Brandis, again, kind of a PRA nerd. Uh, Justice Brandis was, uh, was a Supreme Court justice in the late 1800s. Um, so think about going back 100 years and he's paying attention to what the same kind of things we're paying attention to now. What are the influences going on in government? And he's talking about the, the exact same principles that we've still talked about in terms of, you know, people can see what's going on in government, why government is doing what we're doing. It, it, it invokes or it kind of instills a level of honesty what's going on because all of a sudden, you know, if there was somebody who was like, oh, I could do this, and then, oh, wait a second, people are going to see what's going on, I've got to do something differently, kind of, that kind of thing. Um, so Justice Brandis is writing these theories back in the 1800s, early 1900s. Um, you look at it from the perspective in the upper right-hand corner of headlines. Um, and think about when you read the newspaper, you, you know, you're skimming through trying to figure out what articles you want to read, uh, whether you're doing it in paper format like my dad does, because um, you can actually still get paper newspapers, so it's kind of nice sometimes, uh, versus looking at it on a, on, on a tablet. Um, but the impact that headlines have on the community. Uh, and so if you look at, and these are just three random headlines that I grabbed uh, just as I was doing uh, Google searching and Bing, Bing searching for PRA violations. Um, you know, the the uh, <coughs> files against the city of Tacoma, against the city of Tacoma, uh, the Spokesman Journal, um, another another agency was found to violate the PRA. These kind of headlines have an impact. So think about locally if there was coverage about you know the city of the city of Ocean Shores um, or Pacific County or something like that, and settling a lawsuit, it causes people to question what's going on. So when I'm just you know, talking about the, the importance of of you know complying with the Public Records Act. Part of it's because uh, it's, if, if you get it right, people understand what you're doing. 
if you're getting getting it wrong, then people start to go, oh, I wonder what else is going on. I mean, so it kind of has this downstream implications. Um, and then the other reason agencies should really care about the Public Records Act is it because uh, it comes with some pretty big teeth. Uh, agencies that get it wrong are subject to violation penalties. The biggest penalty that we've seen so far against any jurisdiction in the state is $2.6 million. Um, that was not a normal case. That, that, had some, that had some compounding factors that went into it. More typically, we see judgments and settlements for sixty, seventy, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 for Public Records Act violations. Uh, just to give you the scope, the lowest one we've seen so far is $14. Um, uh, that, was, that was upheld by the Court of Appeals as well, because these, these things can be challenged. Um, what's significant about this is this isn't coming out of insurance carriers' money. This isn't coming out of, you know, call Safeco or you know, whoever the insurance carrier is for the city. This is typically coming out of operating budgets. Um, and so this is another reason why leaders really pay attention and why you know, the city has, or the city of Oakland Shores has a public records officer and why it tries to meet its obligations. Because if something, go, something, if something does go wrong, if there's a judge finds that there's a PRA violation, you know, think about, let's do a small case. Um, if, you, if you go back and look at this one with Hoffman versus Kittitas County, the PRA penalties in that case were $15,000 and the attorney's fees were $45,000. So we're talking about a $60,000 check that they wrote um, to cover this. That came out of the, the operating budget for the county in that case. So from a local perspective, think about the issues that you want your city dealing with. And if they're settling lawsuits for $60,000 or $50,000, what else isn't going to happen? That's the same kind of logic that's going on with the, with the Public Records Act and why people do their best to comply with it. Um, because it is a question of, you know, if we get this wrong, then you know, we're going to have to make some choices. Things aren't going to happen that we want to do. So to give you a, a, a kind of a perspective of you know, what the cities have to do, and this is, this is kind of the high points. Um, you have to have a public records officer. Every, every jurisdiction has to have one. Um, City of Ocean Shores does. Sandy Madison. Oh. <laughs> Sandy. Both of them. Both of them. I'll officially is a, there's a public records officer. And that's the person who is supposed to be the ringleader of public, public records, making sure things happen. That doesn't mean that, I was thinking of Sarah. Um, so city clerk. That doesn't mean that the, that the city that, that that the city the public records officer is, is responsible for everything. What it means is that's the person who's supposed to know the most in the agency about public records and to help make it happen. This really is kind of a team sport. Everybody has an obligation when it comes to public records acts. Um, but that's supposed to be the contact person. That's why if somebody has a question about how do I make a public records request, hey, what's going on with this? They know who to contact. Um, Agency has to adopt a procedure, basically a playbook. How is the city going to process public records? Things in there are such as, who's the person you talk to? How, you know, what's the address? What's normal hours of operation? Um, if the city's going to charge fees for records, what are those fees? Um, there are certain expectations that, that the city or any agency can have on, on public records requesters. Things like, if we ask you for a clarification, you have 30 days to respond. Or if we tell you records are ready, um, you have 30 days to either you know, pay for those records or to come in and inspect for those records. And if you don't do that, we're gonna consider your request abandoned. Um, and you know, it, it's, this, this isn't a secret playbook. This is it basically, this is, and the courts look to this and say, did you publish it on your website? Did you make it available to people? Because if the expectations are reasonable, um, if they're not in violation of other provisions of the PRA, the courts generally have been upholding these. Um, it's, it's, it's like I said, it's a chance. To, it's basically to level the playing field and say, here's what people need to do. Um, so things, other things need to be in there. I've mentioned also, you know, what are the hours of operation? Because agencies have to be open for up to 30 hours a week to inspect records. Um, that doesn't mean that every week somebody's spending 30 hours inspecting records. It's up to. Most of the time, requesters and agencies schedule this. It's really not um, not a huge issue. Uh, every once in a while, and this, this, something did go wrong. There was a city in eastern Washington that sent a requester a letter that basically said, we're too busy for you. Um, you, don't, you, you can only have an hour a week. And when they got in front of a superior court judge, the judge looked and read the law and said, it says 30 hours a week. I've got no wiggle room here. There's not, unless, un, unless you're really busy. Um, and so the courts do hold agencies really accountable to what the legislature has written into the Public Records Act. Um, other things they have to do is what are the usual exemptions that you apply that, that are applied by the city? 
idea is that you, that way it gives you a sense of what you're not going to see. Things like, not surprisingly, birth dates, social security numbers, uh, utility records, and things like that. Um, each jurisdiction is, is, is unique in, in many ways. Cities have slightly different records than, say, the PUD or, or whatnot. So each one is a little bit different. Uh, but this idea is supposed to be giving you notice of, you know, these are our common exemptions. That doesn't mean if they didn't list one there that they can't cite it. Um, it's just supposed to be your, hey, you might want to take a look at this kind of stuff. And then the other thing the agency has to do is it has to keep a public records log. Basically, uh, every request that comes in, they have to on, it's either on a spreadsheet or in a computer program, someplace keep track of, this is our first request for the year, it was from Morgan Tamaro, what did I want? Uh, you know, what, and they have to keep track of, you know, what basically what did they find? What records were produced? Why were they the records weren't produced? Why not? And when was the request closed? Um, it's specifically in a statute, um, but it's one of the few times that the state law actually says you must create this kind of a record. So let's talk a little bit about what is the public record. Um, and I had a choice of putting up on the screen the RCW definition, which is paid their lines and lines and lines wrong. And I, I would, you know, the second it's the screen popped up, I'd see the two of you probably struggle with this because it's really not exciting. So opting, opting for this one. Um, so basically you have to have something in all three of these buckets in, some, in order for something to be a public record. Uh, first off, it has to be a writing. Um, and, you know, that makes sense. The word writing makes sense if you go back to 1972 when the PRA was, was you know, passed by initiative. As we move forward to where we are now, and this is included in the definition, but the best way to think about it is if it's some way that we communicate information, if it's some way that a local government, government employees are communicating back and forth and that can be recorded, it's a public record. So as we've moved into email and databases, because we have lots of records that never see the light of day. They live in the payroll database or the accounting database and they never get printed or anything like that. They're still a public record, um, things like that. It's a, also as we've gotten into text messages or social media accounts, it's a way we communicate information in some kind of a recorded written format. It's a public record. It extends to other things like pictures, uh, voicemail, anything like that. Um, so the definition is rather broad. We don't spend a lot of time talking about it anymore because every time it's been in front of the courts, the courts have in about three sentences said, yep, that's all right. No debates about it. Um, so that's the first bucket. Second bucket is it has to be related to the conduct of government proprietary function of government. So basically, the way to think about that is, it's got to be something that governments do, doing, doing, or something related to something that it's doing. Uh, this was in front of our Supreme Court a couple, three years ago now. Again, this area doesn't see a whole lot of litigation, but what the court in that case said was, we're going to interpret this, and if we went back and looked at that uh, definition or those principles I showed you at the beginning, the court said, we're going to interpret this the same way we interpret everything within our PRA. We're going to try to get as much inside this sphere as we can. Um, and so, you know, related to the conduct of government, it's got to it's got to be pretty far fetched for something not to be related to the conduct of government. Common example I use is say you have two employees that are, you know, one emails a cookie recipe to another one because it's a grandma's cookie recipe, which of course, you know, your grandma's cookie recipe is the best cookie recipe ever. Um, and so you email to that to somebody else, probably not a public record, not related to the conduct of government. However, having said that, what if that's all this person is doing all day long is emailing recipes back and forth? And then the rest. Then this is an this is an evidence of, you know, a cookie recipe. This is the evidence of somebody not doing their job. Then it becomes poss possibly a public record because it, it's showing that they're really not doing what they're supposed to be doing, what they're what they're paid to get, be doing here. Um, and so it's kind of a it's not a one size fits all answer. Um, but again, related to the conduct of government, this is going to be a very broad standard. And then finally, it has to be something prepared, owned, used, or retained. A um, great way to remember that is the acronym for from the first letter of each one of those words. So all the emails that get sent by city employees, uh, all the memos that get drafted, um, those are prepared, they're a public record. Um, anything that is owned by the city. So say the city was looking at acquiring a new piece of property and so they hired an engineer to come in to do a soil study. They wanted to see, or a historical use of the property study, to see how was that property used before. Find out if you know maybe 30 years ago it was a gas station and Okay, in which case they want to know, oh, there's still tanks in the ground, we have to worry about soil contamination, so you hire an engineering firm or a consultant to come in and do that for them. You get this report back as the city, you own that report because that's what you purchased. That's a public record. Um, same idea, say that the city and the fire department was looking at the same piece of property, so the fire department does the study first, um, and so then when somebody from the city goes to the fire department, looks at it, does it, okay, look, 
looks to see whether they want, want to get involved with piece, this piece of property or not. You've viewed that and, that, and then based upon that, the city says, yeah, we're interested. This could be a good place for us, or oh my goodness, not this. This was a junkyard, this was the tanks, this could be a, just a nightmare and a, and a minefield for us. We don't want to touch this piece of property. It's used as part of that decision-making process. And so that's a public record. This came up in a case involving a, a PUD that was looking at building a, genera a generation plant for uh, uh, liquid natural gas. And so a couple city employees went back to, I think it was GE, looked at some engineering specs back at GE in Maryland or something like this. Um, and then they changed the design based upon what they used. Because they, that, that engineering design had been used, had been relied upon in making a decision, it was a public record and they had to go get a copy of it from GE. As you can imagine, GE wasn't really thrilled with this and there was a discussion that happened, but the courts ultimately said, yeah, that's a public record. And then the other one is if something is retained. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about records retention today, but everything the state government, the local government has a retention schedule that tells us how long we're supposed to keep stuff. After that, we can push the delete button. We can drop it in the shredder and not be worried about violating the law of records or retention or something like that. That doesn't happen on a, on a consistent basis. There are agencies that have records that they could have gotten rid of 15 years ago. They still got them because somebody is a document hoarder. Uh, I was talking with an engineer a while ago who had 25 years of calculations um, and trying to get, have this conversation about, you know, this, these are past retention. You don't need these anymore. It was a very tough conversation because this is the way this got processed. And so he had 25 years worth of records. They had all been retained even though they didn't have to be. Those are public records. If they're, if they're responsive to a public records request, the agency was going to have to provide those. Even though they could have gotten rid of them because the obligation of the PRA is to provide everything in existence as of that time of the request. Agencies don't have to make the records. They don't have to make things in response to them. But if it exists, they're supposed to disclose it, either give it out or disclose its existence and tell people why they're not getting it. We'll talk about exemptions in a couple seconds here. Where we've seen the most work recently and most kind of developing area in this world is the question of private devices. And so what happens with private devices is if private devices are used within somebody's the scope of their employment, basically meaning if your job requires it, their boss told them to do it, or furthers the employer's interests, public records can be living on personal devices. Uh, this started kind of really getting popular, you know, catching, catching, uh, catching steam in a case out of Pierce County where the former elected prosecutor he had a personal cell phone, and that's how he communicated with his staff. Daytime, nighttime, was just texting all the time. There was a public records request. I'm not sure what had happened that caused somebody to want this stuff. You know, from a public records perspective, we don't care. So uh, what the motivations of the requester are don't matter to, for the most part. But somebody wanted it, and the court said, yeah, that's you know, part of his job related to the, the management of the office, basically. It's going to be a public record. And it makes, it makes some sense, because if you think about this, if the court said that we can take public records and put them on our personal devices and then ISIS and then not have to provide them, you know, what would be the motivation to turn on my work computer or to turn on my work cell phone if I could do all, all this work externally and, and basically hide it from the world? And the court pretty, I mean, pretty, pretty astutely said, you know, that doesn't make any sense because the PRA would become meaningless at that point. So it comes down to, you know, what's in the record? What's that record about? And this is a record by record analysis. Um, and so it's, you, when we start talking about public records and where they may be, this is the piece, one piece that scares me a lot as we've uh, adopted these new technologies is because no longer are they living within the four corners, so to speak, of an agency. They can, with, with the cloud services and things like that, they can be just about anywhere. Yeah? I, I just want to ask about this. Um, on the question of emails, mm -hmm. we, have, we have a number of commissions in this city that are chartered by the city council, so they're subject to the public records request. Yet they don't have city issued, the, the members of those commissions don't have, I understand it, do not have city issued email addresses. Yep. Is that a good idea? Best practice, the, the, the best practice when working anything, I've, I've got, I have control issues, and I think that's a good way to approach it, um, is I like records back within the four corners of a building, um, if at all possible. I, I think a best practice is to, for people working on the commission for something to do with the city, is to set them up with agency email accounts because that way everything mm -hmm. comes back again. Because what happens when you start moving these devices or this information into personal devices, they're taking on all this responsibility for managing those requests, uh, to managing those records rather, both records retention and then if there is a request, the courts have said nobody, nobody has to turn over their personal devices yet, but all of a sudden you have to do all the work to search for those records um, and you may end up having to do an affidavit ultimately if it gets litigated. Um, basically showing 
you know, yes, I looked on my personal device. Here's when I looked. Here's my search terms. Here's what I found. Here's what was responsive. Here's what wasn't. Here's why the difference. Here's what I did to get the information to the public records officer. Um, versus if you bring, if you know, all that stuff is within the four corners of the agency first, it just makes that a little bit easier. In part because most agencies are doing like electronic searches like that. Essentially, now one person is, is doing searches and pulling all that data down at once uh, for lots of good reasons. Um, so it is a best practice. Thing about it is, some agencies don't have the capacity to do that. Um, it, so it's one of those. You know, if you can, great. If you can't, uh, then you got to be prepared to do it. Other, just you know what you're getting into. Because you know, yeah. Question. Formulate this in my head. That's fine. That we have had issues here in the city because these people on the boards and commissions do not have the city email address. We all know for somebody on the council that it's their first initial and their last name, osgov.com. So if we want to send an email to the people, we can. But in the case of boards and commissions, we are not allowed to have their personal or whatever email address it is they're using. So we can't connect with them. And that always seems odd to me, that if they are on a board or a commission, that would we not, as citizens, have the ability to contact them through email? Just your opinion. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those from a public, I, I approach things from a public records management point of view, not from a public engagement point of view. Um, so I really can't give you a good, solid answer in terms of the best practice on, on you know, how do you engage with folks. But you're right, it is one of the advantages of if, if everybody on the commission had a Morgan Damaro at cityofoceanshores.wa.us, then you would know how to get in touch with me. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, it's, that's really not, the PRA, what the PRA is really caring about is records themselves. Do they exist and what do you do with them once they do exist? Mm -hmm. um, not so much the, the engagement side of things. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. But and, and you know, getting to the point of why you know why I think it's best practice of, of having you know, emails being belonging to a city and whatnot is because the records aren't mine. Um, even though I work for the AG's office and I try to do my best work and I spend a life, I could spend yesterday building a new presentation for what I'm doing tomorrow. You know, doing on Friday morning. Um, you know, they're not my records. They belong to my agency. So that, that that's that's why this matters is because um, you know, no matter where they are. They're not my records. They're city records, and that's that's that's, that's tough for some people to kind of you get really invested in what you do, and so people spend a lot of time working on something, and then it's, it's this is mine. I did it, and you did a great job with it, but it belongs to the city. It's, it's yes. sometimes tough to get people there. Mm -hmm. I'll give you just a brief snapshot into record retention, going back to that retained thing for a moment. Um, but basically, the Secretary of State's office develops re records retention schedules for everything. Um, there, you know, the AG's office has one specific one for our records because we're kind of unique in what we do for the state. Um, for local governments, there's a thing called the core, which is the common records retention schedules for the kind of records everybody has. Um, and then there are specialty schedules for fire departments. There's specialty schedules for law enforcement. Um, and they, they, they basically what this tells, the, tells agencies is how long you have to keep stuff. What's the minimum retention? And one thing I really encourage people to do is to, to follow this. Follow, you know, the record retention schedules are agency's authorizations to push the delete button, mm -hmm. to schedule the shredder to come in, to get rid of boxes of stuff. Um, because, there's, you know, they're written, they're, they're usually longer than they kind of need to be. And for a conservative purpose, that makes sense. From a public records point of view, it goes back to that if you've retained it, you've got to produce it. Um, mm -hmm. If you've got 25 years of engineering reports and somebody wanted all of my engineering, if I was that guy, wanted them all, I would have to produce them. Um, and so that's why I really encourage people to follow the records retention schedule. Save things that are, that are needed, obviously. You know, I've talked with a city that had a copy of a really old insurance policy back when insurance policies would cover um, environmental contamination. And so rather than the city paying millions and millions of dollars to clean up hazardous waste site, the, the insurance company was picking up most of that bill because they kept a copy of this insurance company excuse me, this insurance policy. Things like that you want to save. But generally, a lot of stuff, obviously, there are tons of record reporters out there um, and really encourage public records managers to really help people understand kind of what the, the problems they're creating. Because they should, you know, keep things for as long as you need them. Keep things when you have to have them. Um, like if you're in the middle of litigation or if there's a public records request, those are responsive records, you can't get rid of them at that point. Um, 
but as long as that happens beforehand, and there's a certain category of records the Secretary of State's office will take, things like council meeting minutes after I believe it's six years, you transfer them to the Secretary of State's office, the city is no longer responsible. Let's say that uh, you wanted a copy of a council meeting minutes from 10 years ago, and the city had transferred them. Then the city can say, we no longer maintain that record, it's been transferred to the Secretary of State's office, please give them a call, here's their phone number. Secretary of State's office, their, their archives folks, this is what, they're, they're kind of like me, they, they love records retention, they are amazing people to work with. Um, they'll, get, they'll help you get that information, a lot of times it's posted online. Um, so that, that's what we really encourage people to do. It's not that agencies are trying to hide things this way, um, but think about you know, just how many emails people have sent and received. There's a whole world of records that have no retention value, they'll call it transitory records. Um, things that, like, I get tons of emails, people trying to get me to sign up for webinars and things like that on continuing legal education, or I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten telling me that papers on sale at Staples. Um, no retention value, I can delete those without having a problem. So let's look at what a PRA request looks like. Um, and the thing about this is it looks like everything, it looks like anything. There's no specific format request have to be in. Um, we always, you know, when, I talk, when I talk to requesters, I always encourage them to use whatever tools an agency has, has stood up. A lot of times agencies will have a form on their website or a portal that will let you make that request. Um, but the thing with public records requests is it just has to look like somebody's asking for information. It looks like they're making, they're, they're trying to get some kind of a record. Sometimes people will cite 4256 because we've had this kind of a conversation. Uh, or they've been down this road before. Sometimes a lot of people cite FOIA because that's what people know, the Federal Freedom of Information Act. Um, sometimes it'll just be a letter to the public records officer saying, hey, I'd like to get a copy of insert record here. Basically, if it looks like a duck and if it quacks like a duck, it's a public records request. Um, and this is where you know, public records officers have the ability to, to clarify with requesters because maybe it's not what you intend. Maybe you didn't intend to make a public records request, you're just trying to get information. Because that's what the Public Records Act says, it's your ability to, you know, so to speak, get records from the city of Ocean Shores or from the county. The city doesn't have to explain its records. The city doesn't have to answer questions. If they do, that's, you know, a lot of agencies will have these kinds of conversations, but that's because, you know, they're engaging with people that live in the community. It's not because the Public Records Act says that, that we have to or something like that. Anything else we want to talk about? No specific format. Um, oh, it has to be during regular business hours. That's something in the code. It can even be orally. Um, that, uh, and as you can imagine, oral requests are inherently problematic. Um, but so say, you know, let's say I want to make a request to the city, so I walk into City Hall, and uh, hopefully the person at the front counter is like, oh, this is a hot potato issue. I don't want to get involved in this. And they call up the public records officer, and I can say, hey, I'd like a copy of you know, the council meetings for the last two months. Um, that's okay. You know, that's something that the legislature specifically said you can make oral requests. The courts also recognize that that's, a, like I said, kind of a problematic issue because sometimes what people say versus what they think they said versus what somebody hears doesn't quite line up. Um, but it can, it can be done. We always encourage public records officers and agencies that get these oral requests to follow up in writing and say, Thank you very much. Sometimes, you know, if it's at across the counter, okay, let's write it down for you. Um, did I get this right? Engage in the conversation. Sometimes it might be on a voicemail, um, and so you, you know, they, they leave you enough contact information, so you follow up and say in an email or a letter back to the person, thank you very much. I understand you're asking for whatever it is. And that way, if there's a miscommunication, you can clarify it. A great example of this was a, there was a gentleman who was looking for copies of police reports from an agency. Um, and so the public records officer was like, Oh my goodness, because what the person originally asked for was all, pol all police reports for two years. Um, and, the, so what, and so she was like, that's a lot of paper. So, he, so she wrote back, are you sure that's what you're asking for? He responded, yes. And so and she's like, this is, so something's not lining up here. So she picked up the phone and she called the guy um, and said, okay, let's walk through this. This is what you're asking for. You're, you know, we have seven officers, you know, basically seven days a week rather, 15 officers on average they're making eight contacts a shift, did the math, which I'm not going to do because I'm an attorney and, Matt and Matt, an attorney just can't do that. Um, but basically said, you're asking for thousands and thousands of records. And then the, the, the light bulb went off and the gentleman was like, oh, that's not what I want. I just want any police report with my name in it. And it was like, oh, that's easy, go to have it. <laughs> um, but that was the difference. It was just the other takeaway. That's you know we encourage people to have conversations when it comes to the Public Records Act. 
Um, people sometimes think we have to communicate in writing. And sometimes you, know, you always want document writing, that way there's no misunderstandings. But sometimes those communications are great. They really help understand what you're looking for. Sometimes from a requester point of view, it really helps focus, the, like, okay, you're looking for this kind of record about this issue versus, I want any and all records created by the city in the last two months. Oh my goodness. That's a valid public records request, but that's a whole lot of paper uh, versus being able to say, I want all the records about the city's decision to buy that piece of property I was talking about or something like that. Just, what kind of, yeah. If the city has no system that allows them to search all the police records for if my name appears, is that a reason for not being able to respond? Most, um, you have to go do it manually. You know, so far the, the most systems do allow for some kind of electronic search. If it's like most, most, you know, I've been 20 years since I was a prosecutor, uh, and I was working for a rather, you know, a, not a well-funded agency, but we had a report system that we could do some basic searching on. So um, most should be searchable. So far, the courts have said that agencies don't have to go digging through the filing cabinet to find every, find records. It's got to be identifiable, meaning we have to be able to know where, what basically what it is, where it might be. Um, I'm, but electronic, electronic records typically are searchable in some way. Um, so I'd be surprised if it wasn't, it wasn't somehow searchable. Well, um, there is that there is that tension that says if we can't search it, we and there's been a couple of couple of cases where the courts have said, yeah, you don't have to go open every file to find out where this where these records may be. It's, that's not an identifiable request. It kind of depends upon the way it's framed as well. Um, so you know, generally, from a, you know, switch, let's, let's switch the sides and switch perspectives a little bit, and things that the requesters don't have to do. Um, requesters, or let's say you say you're making that request for that the, for a police report. Generally, why you want the report doesn't matter. What you're going to do with that report doesn't matter. Um, really, the focus is on: is it a request? Did the agency fulfill it? There are some exceptions about exceptions for some unique certain things, like there's a list of individuals. Then they get to ask, you know, what are you going to do with it? But the starting point is, whatever you're going to do with it, that's fine. Um, there's no, there's no way to limit the number of requests. Um, and so let's say that uh, somebody wanted to walk in every day of the week and submit a new request or email in a new request. People get to do that. It doesn't happen very often. Um, I'm aware of it happening a couple of times. Uh, typically, it's disgruntled former employees, um, but not, not always. Um, there are also there are times where people are just so there's something going on in the community that is like, okay, we need to know what's going on. And as the community talks to each other, they're like, oh, let's find get this. Oh, let's get this. Let's get this. So it does happen. There's no limitations on that. Um, it might slow down records production because there's so much to deal with. But there's no way to, you know, there's no limitations on the number of requests that people can make. Um, there, you know, there is no need to, if you look at your agency's PRA policies, it probably has an encouragement for you to say, if you disagree with us, please contact us. Let us know. Let's talk about this. People, agencies can't be, excuse me, requesters can't be required to follow that policy. I still encourage people to have the conversation because the alternative is pretty much litigation, and that's a slow process. Um, you know, I, I've been involved with some cases in uh, PRA litigation uh, that have gone on for like a year and a half, two, three years, um, and so it's. The legal system is not expeditious in some ways, which is good. You want a pragmatic system, but that's why sometimes the conversation can be better. If you have a disagreement, was an, was an exemption applied properly, have the conversation. Um, generally, people can be anonymous as well. Um, I, I was dealing with one requester in one case where all I had about this person was an email address, and it was John Smith of Law at yahoo.com. <laughs> no idea who this person was. No idea where they were. Don't even know if they actually were in the state of Washington, because uh, we get requests outside the state. We still have an obligation to fulfill those. But people in the PRA get to be anonymous, making a request for the most part. Um, it might affect going down the road, like I mentioned, for a list of individuals. Who the requester is might matter. If it's a request for juvenile information or education records or something like that, then the requester the identity may come into play. Um, if it's a re if it was a request, if I was making the request for my own records. Um, and they didn't know it was me, then uh, you know I probably wouldn't get the same record because if it's my if it's say it was my medical records, um, there's not the same privacy interest, and they're not going to take the time to redact my name all over it. Versus if I was asking for somebody else's medical record, obviously I'm not going to get that. I might still get some of the medical records, but they're going to be depersonalized, de-identified. Um, let me give you just a quick introduction to what a public records processing looks like, just so you know what, uh, 
the public records officer gets to deal with on you know, hopefully not a daily basis, but a frequent basis, um, and what the staff is dealing with. It all starts off with that public records request. That's kind of what puts this ball in motion. Um, and that's what says, here, agency, I want something. Within five business days, the agency has to respond you, to you in one of five ways. Um, basically, they have to, if they can, they can give you the records, great. Um, in 2017, the legislature said if it's on the agency's website, then they can give you a hyperlink. That's a way to produce records. Uh, they can deny the records request. Most commonly, that comes up when they have the wrong agency. Um, commonly happens with police reports. Somebody who says, hey, I'd like a copy of the accident report for something that happened on like 109 or Highway 101 or something like that. State Patrol actually has those records or maybe, maybe it was an investigation that was handled by county instead of by city. Um, and so they say, we're denying your request because we don't hold those records. Um, we also encourage agencies at that point to say, but you might want to contact State Patrol or county or something like that. Um, Another, reason, another, another possibility is they can ask for clarification. Um, and agencies, you know, we've been doing it for years, but the, the legislature finally wrote that into the code in 2017. Um, basically, if the agency doesn't understand what you're looking for, um, it allows them to say, uh, to request it, can you give us more information? I don't get this. Um, and let's say that they're, they're, you're asking for three separate things, and two of them are clear, and one of them is not. Um, and so they ask you for clarification on that one. Then the city, if say, you, and so if you respond, great, then they can process all three pieces of it. But let's say you don't respond to that request for clarification. But, and so then with, with the, what the PRA says is they don't have to give you information about stuff that they don't know what you're asking for. But they still do need to respond to the two parts that are clear. And then the other thing the city, the final thing that the city can do, and this happens most commonly just because a lot of things, if you look historically, requests are getting more and more complex for uh, various reasons. They can respond to you within five days saying, we received your request. We anticipate having records to you on October 30, on or before October 31st. Promising you has to be a reasonable period of time. They can't say October 31st, 4045, or something like that. Um, and because if they do, and the courts have said that's an unreasonable delay. That's a denial of access to records. Uh, you know, but 30 days, 45 days doesn't cause me to go, oh my goodness, what are you doing, or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's it's case by case dependent. Um, if it's a small record and the agency isn't real busy with public records requests, that might be too long. 15 days might have been a better number. And we always encourage agencies to look at what's the current current status of things. Because um, that's what the courts are going to want to see. They're going to say, OK, City of Osage Shores, you said 45 days. How did you get there? What was going on that, that, that caused 45 days to be a reasonable time period? Because um, when you start talking about the PRA, typically it's on the agencies to prove they got it right. Uh, it's really from a requester's point of view, after the requester's in, they provide a clarification. Um, it's kind of a spectator sport until they get the letter saying, the records are ready. Um, everything else is, is, is on the agency, and the agency has to prove that it got it right. Um, so after the five-day letter, then the agency has to start looking for records, searching for records that meet your request. We'll talk about that more in a second. Um, and then it goes through this reviewing and redacting. That's when they're going to apply exemptions. <coughs> this takes a lot of, this, these middle two sections take a lot of work. People don't appreciate sometimes, I think, you know, because first, sometimes records, I, like, we all like to think records management is this great, well-oiled machine. Everything's exactly where it's supposed to be. And nobody has that engineer that's got 25 years worth of records. Everybody's got an engineer that's got 25 years worth of, worth of records. And so searching sometimes is not as easy as people believe. Um, but then everything that you found needs to be reviewed. Uh, because I, I, I did employment law for 15 years before I got into doing this full time. And it never ceases to amaze me where sensitive information ends up. Employees are terrible at about writing down social security numbers in the most random place. Um, there's an exemption for that for good reason. You don't want that stuff out there because of the identity theft issues. But you have to find all those as best you can. So every piece of paper, every record has to be gone through. And then the agency produces records. Typically, that's pretty straightforward. We'll, I'll talk about that again in a second. And then they close the request. And when we talk with agencies, you. Think about this in terms of, we encourage agencies to always have the same process. Always, you know, it's not a question of doing it differently, it's always a question of scope. You always walk, it's basically a repeatable, defensible kind of process. So every time a public records request you come in, it says, this is the first step, I'm in box one. Now I'm in box two, and walk through that. If it's a really, really big request, you might get into an installment loop where you're reviewing and reacting, producing, reviewing and reacting, producing. And of course, the, the PRA specifically says that's okay. Uh, because think about the, uh, trying to produce like 5,000 pages at one time. Uh, what if those were accounting records? Could you, I mean, 
the person who would be stir crazy just going through 200 pages of looking through accounting records. Um, and so the courts have said you can package it in, in meaningful kind of chunks. This is supposed to be boring, but it's not. Okay. We'll do it that way. Um, so, the, yeah. What if we've done a public records request and we've been told that it doesn't exist and we believe that it does? Who do we complain to? Um. Can I answer that? Yeah. <laughs> you would complain to me. Yeah, no, that's the first, first, first thing I would do is I would pick up the phone or send an email to the public records officer and say, I, you know, you said it didn't exist, but I think it does, and here's why I think it does. I think Charlie has it. Um, and the more you can share as a requester, I, I suspect if I asked to ask the public records officer last time she tried to hide public records, um, besides her going, uh, um, would be never. Um, because if, if public records really is a customer service job. Um, and so it may be that they missed the record, uh, they missed something you thought existed, or it could be that you know, it existed at some time, but it doesn't anymore. Um, that happens quite commonly too. Um, and so first thing I would do is I would call the public records officer. I think that's, that is the starting place, send an email, something like that. Um, then after that, the, the, the PRA is there's not a, somebody who enforces it, so to speak. It's, I, I, I serve as the ombuds for the office but I don't have the enforcement tool. I don't come in and say, oh, I got this complaint, complaint, show me what you got, or anything like that. I don't have that tool. I can talk with agencies about what they're supposed to do. Did you look in these kinds of places? And that kind of, kind of help understand the scope. Because sometimes people don't get it. Um, but after that, the, the remedy is to take it to a judge, um, and which is why I always say start with a conversation first. Because the second you start talking to a judge, uh, you'll file a lawsuit. And then they have 20 days to file an answer. So you're out another three weeks already, and then you get into a hearing schedule and discovery um, and all those kinds of things, and it just takes time. Yeah. So I'd like to follow up because Sandy is probably one of the best people that I have ever worked with on public records, mm -hmm. and if she doesn't understand what I've asked for, the email comes in and says, can you clarify, and we always do, and I am very grateful, and I want to be on the record in public to say thank you, Sandy, for the work that you do for us. Well, thank you, Susan. I appreciate, appreciate that. And that's that's really I, you know every time I hear that it makes me happy because I, I have nothing to do with it but I, that's what the PRA expects and uh, and, and whatnot so that's I mean, you know, full full credit and I think that, that that says a lot about the city too most cities uh, you know that I mentioned I talk about in terms of customer service um, it really is um, because, but your question is a great is a great segue for this talking about what's those search obligations basically the agency has to search everywhere it's reasonably anticipated records are going to be found meaning that. You know, they don't have to open every filing cabinet to try to find the elusive piece of paper. The courts have been pretty good at recognizing that things get misfiled. Electronic searches aren't perfect. Um, I'm not sure if you've tried to search on your computers for something, and I, I literally saved something, and I was like, I, oh, that was the wrong file. I don't know what file it's in. Tried to search it, it's like, I know the title I just gave that. Why can't my computer find it? I know it's there. Um, and then five minutes later, I do the same search, and it finds it. It's like. So, um, but searching isn't, isn't infallible, but they have to look at where it's reasonably anticipated. Um, and that doesn't mean they get to look at one place that they think it is, they've got to look everywhere they think it's likely to be found. So that means if they've replaced, and sometimes agencies have gotten in trouble for not checking old computers, or um, there was one agency that used to have a big boiler, they used to have a big incinerator in the basement when they, they literally burned stuff to heat the courthouse in the winter. Uh, they switched to natural gas, but they still had this room, and they didn't check that room because they were still taking boxes down there like they were going to burn them someday. They knew they were doing it, but nobody was like, oh, we should, and that didn't happen. That didn't go well for them. But they have to search everywhere it's, 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 it's reasonably anticipated. And they need to document it all because it's always, you know, this is a commonly litigated issue. Agencies have to prove that they got the search right. Did they look everywhere it's reasonably anticipated? Things like, what were the things they should, you know, catch, catch the wide net trying to get as much as they can and then you go through figuring out, okay, what's in my net, what's responsive, what's not. And that's where the court's gonna, you know, the court's gonna say, what did you do in this case? Um, and so we always talk with agencies about, you know, your duty when you come searching is to document as much as you can, everything you do. Well, think about it, like, if anybody's taking a journalism class, the who, what, where, when, why, and how that they talk about building into that, into your, report, into your article. That's the kind of thing that agencies have to prove. Um, because they have to prove that they look everywhere it's reasonably anticipated. Um, Agencies miss stuff. It happened. Um, and like, there's an example out of City of Tacoma or the, with the Department of Ecology case where they turned over something along the lines of 35,000 pages. 
and in the course of that, they missed 300. And the court, basically, I think what the court, and this is my, my take of it, is they went really big, really, really small that doesn't even match up. And they, but they could show, they looked at everything they, they were supposed to. They had gone back, and they had even talked to outside consultants they were hired to try to get their own records back. They had turned over all the stones they should have turned over. The court said, they missed something, that's okay. I think also what helped them, and we talk, you'll, you'll see this from agencies as well, is when records get missed and you find them later, put them in an envelope, put them in an email, send a request to saying, hey, we found this record, we think it's responsive, um, so we're, we're providing it to you free of charge. Um, it, you know, it, I think that's the other thing that helped both like the city of Tacoma in a case and the, and the Department of Ecology. It's that you know we're not trying to hide anything. This just didn't didn't show up. Common problem is trying to find graphic files. Pictures are not searchable, so you have to do it by keyword search. No, and if you if you ever look at the, the names that your cameras give to files, it's some strange date combination with a decimal point and other stuff. So trying to find that stuff is really difficult. It's still not working, by the way, so I'm going to not pick it up again. Um, I'll just talk briefly about contractor records. Is then your agency? The agencies do a lot of work with contractors. No agency can do everything themselves. Um, so a lot of times, agencies have contractor records, and I'm going to talk about this more with city council and about ways to approach contracting. Um, but it's, it, 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 well, it, it is a, a sensitive topic, topic um, only because think about you know. In, in, when somebody's contracting with, a, with an agency, sometimes they put proprietary information in there, um, and they, it's like, okay, if you, if you release this, you're going to give away my unique way of doing business, and all of a sudden, think about it, you know, if Boeing had to give out all their engineering stuff for the way they built the 787. Um, obviously, Airbus would love to get a hold of that, but the courts have said that you can, you can protect some of that kind of information. The way to think about that, and what we've talked about with, with contractor records, is to think about it in advance and have them pre-mark stuff that is proprietary or think they think is sensitive. Um, it's a really, a, a really nitty, nitty pretty. Does anybody have questions about contractors? That's about as far as I'm going to go. Anybody? Yeah, um, yeah I, have, I have a question. Yeah. All the way. A record, let's say a record should exist because it's in a contract that the contractor is supposed to deliver that record to the city. Mm -hmm. But the record doesn't exist because the city never got off the you know what and made sure the contractor delivered. I'm, I'm thinking here about financial reports, for example. If you lease something to somebody and there's a requirement for financial reports, we've seen that. Yeah. They don't exist. From a public records point of view, that you're, you're the record doesn't exist. The record doesn't exist. Yeah. Therefore, it doesn't exist, and the agency doesn't have to create a record that yeah. doesn't exist. Whole separate issue as to what the contract may authorize people right. to do, whether that whether there's a bit of breach of contract or whether they're exercising their rights under the contract. But what the public record cares about is, does it exist someplace? And if it does, then you need to provide it. Um, it the fact that the agency could have could have gotten this report from God, wow, there's a, I usually go off my daughter for using words like that. Could have received this report from somebody and didn't, isn't a PRA concern. Um, whole separate issues in terms of somebody else might care about that, but the Public Record Act is really a binary question. Does it exist? Yes or no. If it exists, you produce it or you tell them why they're not, why they're not getting it. So, so how am I doing time wise? Not that I, okay, still not over time yet. I, I can talk about this for hours. Um, and Sarah's like, no, please don't. No. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so I'll give you, let me give you a little, so we've talked about records, where they exist, they say they find, they find the record, they're looking at it, and they're going, okay, is somebody going to get all this record, um, yes or no? And if, they're, if the answer is no, then the agency has to be able to point to the thing called exemptions. Um, and because the starting point is, it's a responsive record, then we have to tell you that this record exists, and we have to give you a copy, um, whatever it may be. Um, unless we can find one of these exemptions. Um, and just to let you know, there are 500 of these plus more exemptions in state law. And I can tell you, I do not have them all in my head. I can tell you the ones I've dealt with most recently. I can tell you a lot of employment ones, because that's what I did for 15 years. Um, I'm constantly looking them up. Um, but they exist in either the PRA itself in 4256, or the PRA says we can look outside. We can look to other areas of state law. We can look to federal law. Uh, to, but we have to be able to point to something that says, this is confidential information. Not just that it's sensitive information, because we produce sensitive information all the time, but there is something that says this is confidential. This is stuff that's not supposed to be produced. And sometimes it's very specific. 
Um, there's a specific exemption for social security numbers, um, but that would not cover employer, employer identification numbers. They kind of accomplish the same thing, but SSN, social security numbers apply to people, employer identification numbers apply to corporations and LLCs and things like that. There's a separate exemption for that. But that's the kind of nitpicky work you have to do with exemptions. You have to look at the exact text, because that's what the courts do. Uh, a few years ago, we were litigating dates of birth and whether employee dates of birth for the public employees were subject to release. And the court went through and looked at other places in the code and said, I find one specifically calling out dependents. There was an exemption for law enforcement at that time, for, but for general employees, there was no exemption. And so the court said, I can't, I, you know, I can't go beyond what the courts have, excuse me, what the legislature has said is exempt. Um, and the courts, you know, Go back to about 1986, there was a case of developing privacy where the courts kind of took a more of an expansive look uh, at privacy. And the, the, literally the next session, the legislature came back and said, oh, you got that wrong. We really meant it was supposed to be the last, the, the last time, the last definition you're using before your decision. Um, and so that's where the courts look at it. They said, you know, we got chastised basically once before for tr over reading the Public Records Act exemption. So now we're going to draw that box around the exemption as tightly as the words allow us. Um, and so if it says social security number and that's all it says, that's all you get. Uh, one that kind of drives me crazy on a regular basis is uh, identifying information is exempt. What is that? Uh, my name is identifying, okay, I'm good with that. My date of birth, that's identifying? Yeah, I think so. Um, but how far does that go? What context does it in? It's not really well defined in lots of places. But that's the kind of thing they have to find um, if, if they're gonna, if, if agency's gonna hold something back. Because what happens is, they can't just pull out the Sharpie, or a lot of agencies use Adobe and put a black box on something and just give it to you, because they have, but as a requester, what you're entitled to is an explanation from the agency. What's the law, what, so what exemption are you relying on, and how does it apply to this document? Example, you know, it's 4256-230, uh, subpart three, this is, uh, subpart three, this is uh, violated an employee's right to privacy. Um, and that's, the, we'll talk about privacy in, a, in just a second. That's the kind of thing you have to, that agencies have to do. Um, and they, you know, that sometimes you'll hear talk about this thing called silent withholding. What that means is that there was a record that existed that they didn't disclose because I came back to that binary kind of thing. If the record's responsive, you either get the whole record or you get the record with an exemption log or some kind of redaction log that tells you what you're not getting. There's no third option for, ooh, let's put this over here, here and hide. Um, by the way, that doesn't happen very often when things get hidden. It's more common when things get missed. Uh, but that, that's still silent withholding. Um, one other thing that commonly comes up is this idea of a draft. There is no draft exemption. So like, if, you, if somebody was to write three versions of a memo, um, and all three versions of that memo existed uh, when you put public records requests came in, all three versions are responsive. They're separate documents. You don't just get the final one. There is this thing called the deliberative process exemption, and what that protects is policy level decisions while that policy level decision is, is being made. And so that the agency can have those frank conversations to determine uh, you know, do we want to do we want to grow? Do we want to annex this area to the north or to the south or something like that? What's the what's the benefits to the city? What's the, what, how would you know, what's going to could negatively impact this? So they can have those conversations. Once that decision is made, the deliberative process exemption vaporizes. It, it no longer exists. Um, so I mentioned where I mentioned privacy a second ago. I want to touch on this one just because this I get lots of phone calls from people. Because as you can imagine, I'm sure the city has a lot of records um, about folks that live in the city. I'm not sure what utilities the city, what utilities does the, the, the city operate? What water. type of what, utilities? Yeah, what you think, water? Yeah, yeah water okay. and sewer. So they, they, water and sewer, which means they probably have you know, billing information, they've probably got account information. For most people doing electronic payments nowadays, uh, when you signed up for service, you may have given social security numbers, whatever is on that application process. Um, so a lot of times I get, and, and like times I get calls from members of the public saying, I just got this letter from the Department of Retirement System, and they're going to release all this information about me. Um, I actually got one of those two days ago. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. yeah it's, it, there, it is out there. There's a reporter from the Seattle Times who's requested a lot of data from uh, the Department of Retirement Systems. And so I got this letter that said, what about my right to privacy? The right to privacy in the PRA is extremely high, or it's extremely guarded. It is very, it is, it's not stuff that's embarrassing, it's not stuff that's sensitive, it's that core part of you that you don't talk about with anybody other than your partner, or your doctor, or your attorney, or your priest, or your counselor, or something like that. It is, it, it's, it's things that are, 
highly offensive to a reasonable person and not of legitimate public concern. Um, and so you've got to be able to satisfy both of those if you're going to say that this is, this is private, uh, private information. Um, one of my colleagues used to comment about, you know, is there really even any privacy left in the PRA? Um, I'm still willing to say there is, but that beach is eroded a lot. Uh, Washaway Beach is large, it's much bigger than, than privacy in the PRA, quite honestly. Um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of standard that, and this is actually, I mentioned in 1986-87, the Supreme Court issued a decision. It's because they read privacy a little more expansively, and the legislature responded literally in the next session and said, no, 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 we want that narrow definition. Let's go back in time and continue that forward. Um, so privacy, don't, when it comes to public records, they're, they're, people that have a high expectation of it often have a, a moment of, oh my goodness, um, I did not realize that. It's also not a standalone, just like only two bucks. It's also not a standalone exemption. Um, it, this is the definition. It also has to exist in another exemption itself. Uh, things like I get, things that somebody's personnel file are exempt to the extent it would violate my right to privacy. So, if anybody wants to write a request letter to the AG's office requesting my appointment letter as an AG, not private. Um, if you sent that same letter in and said that you wanted my annual evaluations, the courts have said that is private. Uh, because they said that is, there is no legitimate, that's not a legitimate concern to the public. Because I think it was a pragmatic kind of decision that the court said, you know, if all evaluations were ever released, nobody would ever get a bad evaluation. I mean, there would never be, Morgan needs to work on. Everybody, everybody would always go, great job. Um, and it would just become meaningless. The exception to that is if there's a specific instance of misconduct. I travel a lot around the state with work, talking with folks. Um, and let's say that I got impatient and I was driving by the state's little Ford, uh, it's a RAV4 I have today, and I was going by Moses Lake doing 105, 110. First off, that's really scary because I didn't think that car would go that fast, it'd probably shake. Um, but say I got pulled over and then and my person, my evaluation said, Morgan needs to slow down and not try to break the speed, not try to break the sound barrier in a state car. That would be a specific instance of most conduct, that would be released. Uh, the rest of the evaluation probably wouldn't be, but that specific instance would be. Yeah, told you I wouldn't forget. I oh, did forget about you, but I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. I was actually thinking about you driving at that speed, and I was smiling. <laughs> oh, I haven't said it, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it would scare me. I, just... I think we'd all be scared. Oh, yeah. Um, credit cards, yes. employee credit cards, is that information a part of a public records request that citizens can see what they are actually spending the money on? Yeah, the state's the expenditures of money is public. You might not get the account, you might not get the, maybe you might get the account number itself, mm -hmm. but the expenditures um, what they're for. are public records that you could know, say, you could, you know, you could find out, you know, what, like the state has, a, the AG's office has a, sta has a state credit card that we use to purchase things. Um, and you could get its purchase history, uh, and you'd find that I bought a new case for my computer when my old one broke two months ago. Um, and so, I, so I don't, that's public record, yeah. Okay, thank you. There are specific exemptions for, I'm not gonna go too far into it, for dates of birth, kind of what you'd expect. Um, <laughs> application, there's a specific, specific exemption for application information. Um, I mentioned that what's in personnel files, that's exempt. Um, there's specific exemptions for driver's license numbers, the idea of account numbers, there is exemptions for that. Um, you know, as a, as a, I, get my, I get paid electronically, so the state has the routing number and my account number. There's an exemption for that. It makes a lot of sense. A lot of the exemptions make sense. And then there's the other ones that exist because they're dealing with a very specific issue, and they apply to one agency at one unique situation. Sometimes you just have to know the history of it. There's like uh, when the state started issuing enhanced driver's licenses back in 19, when it was 2007. Um, there was a specific exemption written because they had to start collecting copies of social security, uh, birth certificates and things like that, and they realized oh, we have to have protections for that. So sometimes they're very specific to agencies. Yeah. Are personal voting records uh, public information? Um, the the fact that you voted is available, but the how you voted in any in any one in any one race is is actually very heavily guarded. Uh, there's been a number of cases where people have tried to get. Uh, copies or electronic copies of voting records in our Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals have been, and, and trial courts, have looked at the constitutional protections and then the, the, state, or the, the Secretary of State's office implementing those and said, nope, those are off limits. People don't get that. Yeah. I don't have the exact same thing. This is just like, uh, I don't have the exact exemption for it because I said there's 500 of them, but yeah, uh, there's been, it's been litigated a couple, three, five times. Yeah. What, a public, what about a public servant's voting record like a city councilman? 
Um, and like, let's say there's a council member, all, four, all three of them are sitting up here, and you want to know how did you vote on doing annex an area or raise, raise the sewer rates or whatnot. Um, that's all public record. That, in fact, that specific under the OPMA is expected to happen in public. Um, yeah, thank you. Look, and it's probably reflected in the minutes. Uh, most commonly, it is. So I told you I'd give you just a quick heads up or introduction to production of records. But basically, is agencies get to kind of establish the framework how they're going to produce records. Um, they get to charge for records, and it's not big money. Um, there's a default number built into the Public Records Act, um, and it, you didn't have to be sitting down for these numbers because next to they're not big. Um, for a, a photocopying a piece of paper, they get to charge 15 cents if they actually have to photocopy it. It's basically the time it takes to run that through the machine and the cost of the paper. Um, it's the actual production costs. They get to charge 10 cents for scanning it if they're going to produce it to you electronically. Uh, they can charge five cents for every four attachments to an email, and this was based on it, and they can charge 10 cents for every think, gigabyte uh, of data they give you. There was a cost study done by the city of Seattle some years ago now, where they literally had people time how long it took to do stuff, and they had somebody else following somebody around with a stopwatch and say, and then they took a look at what, you know, what their hourly rate was, um, and then they backed it off from that, and they came up with these numbers. 2017, the state adopted these as defaults, but basically it's, this is the, uh, those are, the, those are the fees that you can get charged. Inspection of records is always free. You can always schedule time to come in. Now that the proclamations are gone, you can schedule time to come in up to 30 hours a week. Um, I always encourage people just to talk to the public records officers. Find time that's mutually agreeable. Um, most of the time, you can work something out. Inspection is always free. Um, there's some unique fees. Uh, the, a couple of agencies have unique issues. Uh, Body-worn cameras, are, the technology is just being implemented by a lot of law enforcement. I think the city here is looking at that or in the process of doing that. Those have some unique fees built into it. Things that are recorded with the county auditor have some unique fees for a different, different schedule. But as the default, we're talking about you know, minimum production costs. Because everything else that goes into, the produ into producing public records, all the staff time is a cost of doing business. It's a cost of transparency. Um, and this is really the, the, the idea behind it is now we're incurring something else. We actually have to you know, get a ream of paper and run it through the photocopier, and it's going to cost you 15 cents a page, uh, that kind of thing. Um, any specific questions? I, don't, I know I'm, I'm approaching the end of the, my time, and so I don't want to go too much longer. Yeah. But yeah. On inspection of records, it uh, seems to me there's a disincentive to have inspection of records, because then you have to produce reams and reams of paper which most of which the person doesn't even want anyway, okay? And then you have to save those and archive those. Isn't there a disincentive to, isn't there an actual incentive for the agency that go to electronic at a much cheaper cost per page, gigabyte of data to 10 cents? Um, and most, in a lot of, a lot of more, a lot of, a lot of more, wow, I'm just losing my ability to talk. Um, <laughs> A lot of records are, a lot of agencies are moving more towards electronic records production. And it's just because so many records live electronically, say you want an email, they live electronically, they can just be copied, even if they have to be converted to a PDF format. Where it gets unique if they have to be redacted, um, and things like that, that's where you might get some conversion issues. But, you know, it goes both ways. I, I've seen some people who adamantly want to look through the records because they don't want to get 5,000 pages, they want to say, Oh, I want these 15 pages. This is what I really care about, and that's how they focus what they get instead of having their kitchen table, you know, piled high with records. The electronic records are becoming more and more prevalent, though, and it's you know, it is. I know some agencies aren't charging for aren't charging for records because you know, at five cents for every four attachments. That's a lot of attachments before they're collecting a dollar, and what's the labor hours to collect a dollar from people? And that's the other thing people can do is they can set a set threshold where we're not going to charge for something below the threshold because it's just not worth our time to get our 10 cents. Mm -hmm. I'm going to double back on the idea. I started with that slide talking about the penalties. Penalties are set by the courts, and it goes into the question about what happens if you hear your question about what happens if you don't get a record. You go to the judge, you ask the judge to tell the agency they got it wrong, and then you, then the judge gets a motion from someplace says, "And now I want you to impose penalties because I've been denied access to records." And it could be because they didn't give it to you. Also, could be because it took too long for them to give it to you. It's a fact-specific question. Um, but basically the courts have discretion to, within the range of zero to $100 per day per document, uh, to set penalties. And the idea behind the penalties is to encourage future performance. 
Um, and actually, I was reading something that before I came down here this afternoon. I uh, was talking about the, for a while, these numbers were getting really big, really fast. And then there's been kind of a realization, and this actually, the, the court, that $2.6 million case I talked about, that was, that was remanded back to the trial court because the court said, this is too big. You're talking about public funds here. We can't lose track of the fact that we're talking about public dollars. Mm -hmm. Is this really going to accomplish, is $2.6 million really going to accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish here? We think you got the calculation wrong in a few, in a few spots because the per page, per person penalty for the jurisdiction was a very large number. Um, but the courts have discretion, and as long as, the, generally, as long as the courts give a well-reasoned decision as to, I landed on five cents per page for 380 days, therefore the math is, I can do it. Um, that's what the number is. As long as it's well-reasoned, the, the Court of Appeals, Supreme Court has said, we're gonna let that stand. Uh, we understand how the court got there. That $14 one was appealed, and the, the Court of Appeals said, it's low, but it makes sense. There were some good facts. That was against the governor's office. When they realized the mistake, they jumped up. So they basically, the person had been denied, denied access to records for 14 days. Uh, they missed part of a request, and then the person filed a lawsuit really fast. Uh, and that was a gentleman named Arthur West, who's a frequent requester. Full credit to him for going, something's missing here. I don't, I don't, I don't know if he talked to the agency or not for him. Uh, it's always where I encourage folks to start. But they jumped on it. They produced it. It was 14 days later. I think that. There's a, there's a reason it ended up at fourteen dollars. It seems too convenient for my way of thinking, but uh, I wasn't part of the conversation, so I don't know. Uh, yeah. Your do your slide says for document. Yet you're talking about penalties per page. So what is the difference between a document and a penalty per document and a per page per day? It depends on what depends on what judge we're talking to. It's it said that if you look in the PRA, it says per page. Commonly, the, it's, well, not commonly, sometimes judges look at it as a per page penalty. Uh, for math purposes, um, and so it kind of, and the courts, um, and you know, no, no court, the appellate court that I'm aware of has, that's, it's come up a couple times, and as long as it's well reasoned, the court said, yep, we'll go with, we'll let them go with per page versus per document. I've, I've had these conversations with judges in terms of agencies that maybe have gotten it wrong in terms of which do you choose, and uh, what I've seen is that if judges go per page, the per page penalty tends to be lower. Um, if they go per document and say it's uh, you know because the document's you know 100 pages, then the per document number tends to be a little bit higher. And so it seems to be it all kind of comes out in the wash. Yeah. In 2020, the mayor of Seattle allowed some not so nice people to take over part of the town. They pass out semi-automatic weapons. Four people ended up shot. Two of them dead. All of her texts are missing. Oopsie. Um, what's going to happen with that? Uh, I can see the city of Seattle file, having need to file bankruptcy. Well, what a big question. Um, I'm going to limit myself to the public record well, piece of that. Well, okay. um, but <laughs> in, in, in 1972, Rosemary Woods erased 18 minutes and Nixon was driven from office. The mayor, the former mayor of Seattle is still walking about a free woman, and she was in charge of that, and I believe she ordered the destruction of that. This is my guess, just as an observer. Don't know about who made the decisions. Uh, again, they didn't call me, um, and, but I was, funny, I, was, I was reading an article about that this weekend, and I think it was Seattle Times that was saying that case has been referred to the King County Prosecutor for investigation. Um, for the destruction of records. I have no idea what's going to come out of that. That does happen from time to time. There was a case with, uh, um, uh, which county was it? I think it was Stevens County? I'm going to Stevens County. About 20, 15 years ago now, the Stevens County auditor was using the credit card of the county to purchase things, and then he was being audited, and then as a way to you know, try to cover his tracks, started destroying records. He ended up getting charged in that case uh, for not following for the illegal destruction of records. Um, so there are there are repercussions. But I don't know what's going to happen in Seattle. I'm not privy to the it's not what happened to get there. I've read the same thing you've read in terms of the paper, um, in terms of there were these, the, these text messages that weren't there anymore. In that chain of command, is it reasonable to assume she ordered it? I have no idea. I have no idea how things happen. Um, if it was be complete speculation on my part. I don't know. You understand this doesn't play well with the general public. Oh, I, you know, I, 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 
I read the newspaper, you know, the articles, and that's one that I, I, I read on a regular basis because obviously I was reading, I, I mentioned I was reading it this weekend every time I see a headline on it uh, because it's still something that's in the public attention, still something the media is watching very closely uh, to see what happens with it. Yeah? Quick question because I know we're going to come up to the end and I won't get my question. So it's not to <laughs> I'm happy to talk for as long as you like really to listen. So it's <laughs> Thank you. So this is regarding social media, Facebook. Yeah. A council member posts on Facebook on some page, maybe his own, maybe on a group page, and he's discussing city business on that Facebook page. As citizens, are we allowed to do a public records request for all of those postings that that person is making? And if so, how do we go about it? Because sometimes elected officials will block you from their Facebook page so you can't see it. But someone else is telling you that this conversation is taking place. So from a public records <laughs> point of view, it, it will depend on your request. If you wanted all communications from the mayor about this topic, and your friend had told you that topic's being discussed on the Facebook page, um, if it's within the mayor's or the council member's scope of employment. Uh, so it's, think about the definition, it, it applies to electives as well. So if it's their job requires it, if it, uh, their boss tells them to do it, or if it furthers their, further their, further their employer's interest, it's a public record. Um, this has come up a number of times. Um, like I mentioned the name Arthur West a couple of times tonight. Frequent requester, um, he's litigated, I don't know, last time I looked, 35 cases or something like that, I can't remember the exact number, over, over his history. Um, he's made, and he's helped develop the, the PRA in lots of good ways in terms of what we're supposed to do. Um, but he was making a number of requests to the city of Puyallup. Um, and so the court said in that case, for it was to the council member for the city of Puyallup um, in two different contexts. One was a personal Facebook page, the other one was social media posts. And the court went back to that scope of employment and said, is this something that's within their scope of employment? Also happened in Clark County. Um, and what the, the court said, yes, they could be there, but let's look at each individual record. The one, the one the case that's coming to mind with uh, the city of Puyallup the, what the council member was talking about was actually thing that the city was doing, and so it wasn't within anything the council member could have any influence or control over. And so the court said, in that case, not a public record. So it's really going to depend upon what the what the post is, what's what's the conversation. So if it's a voting issue, if they have voted on it or will be voting on it. Yeah, it depends. And, I really, okay. I, and this is people ask you know, people ask me, what about this record? My my, span, my typical answer is, I want to see the record before I you know, be, would hazard a guess. But that's the framework that it fits inside of. Yes. Um, Thank you. That because that's, that's what it comes down to. Each time, it's all about each individual record. It's not just about I'm the mayor, always the mayor. No, I guarantee the, the city council member has posts about a fishing trip or grandkids okay. or what they did on vacation, something like that. That not public record. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, wrapping it up, just to give you just to give you a flavor of what we talk about with agencies all the time. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot about culture. So when you said that you know, the public records office is great, that's, that's the kind of thing I really like to hear versus I get phone calls from folks that are like on the other end of the spectrum that's saying they're not and they don't. And it's like, okay, let's see what we can do. Because sometimes it's a question of education, helping people understand obligations. So it's really great to see that's kind of what we're talking about in the city. And the city is really, does, you know, does, follows through, does what it can. Um, because it, it comes down to training. We really encourage, it's not just the public records officer's job. I've talked about that engineer a couple of times tonight. Because it's, you know, I'm responsible for my record. There's a microphone right there. Um, <laughs> I'm responsible for my record as the, uh, if anybody's listening on the radio, I'm sorry. Um, I'm responsible for the records I produce at the AG's office. Um, fortunately, a lot of those electronically, we can search them easily. Um, but if I have paper records in my office, I'm responsible for producing those to a records request. Um, if somebody was to send me a PRA request, it would be my obligation to get it to our public records officer as fast as I can, because we would have that five business days to respond. So it really is, it is, it is, it is this really is a team sport. Um, encourage folks to look at the procedures. If you have questions about what the city's going to do, look at the city's public records policy. And I encourage cities to look at their own every once in a while, and it's like, okay, is this still match what we're doing? Keep it relevant to the way you're currently doing business, because as technologies have come along, we've changed a lot in the way we do things. Um, part of it's talking about resources, um, and you know, I talked with somebody earlier today that was talking about a public records request, and they had, they had, had actually a good example of this is the Scrim School District. 
Uh, their Scrim, Scrim School Board, every month, they, I think they're still doing it, was getting reports from their public records officers as to the status of their public records request. Were they going up, were they going down, how much time was it taking? And because they were trying to decide, was it staffed properly? Um, because this is, public records is one of the essential functions. It's not the essential function, but it's in, if you, talk, if you look at the court's positions, it's always within the, the upper crust of things that are supposed to be happening. Going back to those policy versions I started with in terms of, because this is, people don't yield their sovereignty to the agencies. They, they let us stand in, in they, let, they put us in the driver's seat, but they can take us out of the driver's seat as well. Um, that's really what the Public Records Act expects. Um, part of it's keeping up to date. Um, and, you know, that's part of the reason my program exists, is to help agencies. There was, I think, you know, the, the 20, so there's always been, well, since uh, Ralph McKenna was in office, there's been an ombuds who was answering questions. And kind of an outgrowth of that was a recognition that there are 2,300 local jurisdictions throughout the state. Um, and they don't all have the resources to, to they face turnover. Things change, and so trying to help agencies stay up to speed is really important. That's part of what I do through trainings, through talking with folks. When I'm heading for, yeah, I said I'm heading for Eastern Washington next week. Um, as I travel along and I, I drive by a city hall, I stop and just walk in, and introduce myself, and say, "Hey, anything I can do to help?" Um, that, that's really important. That's an expectation. Helping agencies need to stay up to speed and give training to city council. The staff, even you know, everybody agency, you know, they need to know everything your public records officer the Sandy needs to know, but they need to know a PRA 101, uh, know what their baseline obligations are. Um, and sometimes I tell people the best thing you can do is talk to your attorney, um, figure out what your obligations are, figure out if you're doing it right, take advantage of all the collective resources you have. Um, from a requester point of view, when I'm talking to requesters, um, something I commonly ask when they still, when somebody's calling to complain about something is. Here's some information. I recommend you talk to the city. You know, I recommend you talk to the county. It's a great place to start. A lot of times, if you, if it's a, say it's a disagreement over an exemption, it gives chance for people to go back and say, oh, we got that wrong, or that's right, here, let me give you more information. And it helps get to an understanding of what you're not seeing. Maybe you can resolve things. Maybe the city would say, yeah, we were right, but yeah. big picture-wise, we'll, we'll step back. It's not that, huge, not that, not that significant. Or it may help the professors understand Oh, okay, I now understand. Yeah, I'm not happy, but yeah, I can see how they got here. That kind of thing. So that was supposed to be a training a week ago, um, and like I said, for various reasons, I didn't make it. Um, but I'm glad. Actually, I'm really glad I didn't now because I really enjoyed having this kind of conversation. Uh, because I have to do this every once in a while. Uh, I did it with some reporters from Spokane a while ago, which is a very different conversation. Reported, uh, but uh, so very glad to be here. Any other questions? Yeah. You're correct that Ron, Ron McKenna did have a, a public records on Lisbon, okay? And maybe that's your job now. But when you contacted that person as a citizen, the answer was, no, no, we, you know, go fly a kite. I only talk to state agencies. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the answer that was given by that person. And I guess my question is, if I write to you with a question on public records, because you're the current, you're, you're the ombudsman, ombudsman now. Yes. What would you say to me? Um, Besides, go hire an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, depends on the question, but you know, I I try to best I can provide you information. Sometimes I call agencies to say, hey, if this is the information I'm getting. If this is true, or what else is there? What else is going on? Um, it depends on the question I'm being asked. Sometimes the best I can do is say, here's what the law requires. I can't tell you if they violated it. But here's what here's what the PRA expects. Hopefully that helps you understand. You know, do I need to take it further? Either go back and talk to the Sandy and the bus so I could say, Sandy, you disagreed with Sandy. Say, you know, I got this information back from from the ombuds. This is what he's sharing with me. Help me understand what's going on here um, and whatnot. Because I, I I can't represent people, and you know, I've got unfortunately a few too many emails I still haven't responded to. But I try very hard to get back to people. That are, relatively short basis. Oh, provide any information I can. Are you that person with the current AG? I am that person. That, that used to be Bob McKinnon had somebody. Uh, yeah, it was. You're that same position. It started with Greg Oak Street, then it was Tim Ford, Over then Street. Nancy Creer, and then that was me. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I, I like this topic. I'm weird that way. <laughs> and I'll share what information I can. I can't tell the, I can't tell you whether they're getting it right or wrong, um, but I can give you information. Sometimes I call agencies and say, Here's the information I'm getting. Um, here's I show the same information. It, it's not a, it's not a, I have a secret kind of moment.
And if you want, actually, a better one, that's actually for the consultation program. A better one to contact me for the is agoombuds at atg.wa.gov. You write to that one, I'll still respond, I promise. So we'll actually put this slide and the email address that you just went on the city website for the city chat that was tonight, so that anybody that wasn't able to make it will be able to go back, look at this from North Beach Community TV and the slide that was given. And we hope to have you back for OPMA next. Yeah, we'll have to come back. That's, yeah. That would be the ombuds happening. You talk about mm -hmm. open government and how meetings are supposed to happen. So I'm happy to have that conversation. And I just wanted to highlight on a couple things. Sandy has done an excellent job. In 2021, we updated our procedures per ordinance. We follow the state for fees because I'm not into making up like, oh, we're going to do five cents here and six cents there. It was just easier to follow the state. And also all of our public records are published. So if somebody's done a public record, you can go see it. So if it's something that interests you, High Dune Trail, golf course, all the ones, go look, because it's all there. So everybody that's requested it's there, all the information that was provided is there. You can go check that out, those packets that we left there, and we'll also attach that. Our how, where our policy is, where you can find those published documents, our office, office hours, we're always there. So. You can always email us. Or and always calls. email. Yeah. <laughs> we get less emails than you. I think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for coming. No, I'm glad I was able to make it down there. I, I, actually, I was supposed to be down here last Monday, and on Monday I was commenting, oh, this would be a great day to be down at Ocean Shores because it's such a nice and so I was thinking I was thinking it was Tuesday. Um, Tuesday was still nice, but today and today is beautiful too. It's but, all uh, work out better. Yeah, I'm, I'm not complaining at all. So, yeah. so. all right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.